إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. Verily, whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. And I bear witness, as you bear witness, that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He is alone having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is the slave of Allah and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention, grant him peace, send his blessings and his salutations upon him, upon his wives, companions, and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness. As to what follows, the flagship of hardship. Uh, pretty interesting because, you know, that title was shared on a few WhatsApp groups. <laughs> and it created like all this kind of... Uh, this, all these discussions about what the uh, topic will be about, ranging from ISIS to the end of times to ruling on Facebook and WhatsApp to I don't know what, all types of things came to mind when people read the title. And speaking of WhatsApp, um, there will be a dedicated lecture, inshallah, uh, about WhatsApp. I think it's going to be called, What's Up? WhatsApp or what's up with WhatsApp because that thing is like the thing right now remember when Facebook was the thing but anyways I don't want to drift off the topic the flagship of hardship well the reason why it's confusing because many people don't know what flagship is it's actually, it's actually one of these confusing terms because the general meaning it has to do actually with the ship that has a flag right which is not what comes to mind look it up in a dictionary it's like if there are a bunch of ships the one which has the flag that like, everyone follows, that's the flagship. But nowadays it's used for being the most important component of a group of things. So each company, if they have you know, air conditions and they have 10 of them, the flagship AC is the one which is the hero among all other air conditions. And the smartphone business, it's something along the same lines. So it has to do with that which is highlighted or that which is the most important element of, among a group of things of similar nature. Hardship doesn't need to be defined. Why? We are going through it right now. We are going through hardship around the clock. Whether we are in the state of blessing or we are in the state of distress and agony, it's a hardship. Simply because what appears to be good sometimes brings about disasters and that's hardship. So it's a really, it's a tricky thing. Um, and if we are not equipped properly to deal with these hardships, then we will lose at the end of the race. There's a long race. It's a long race till the finish line. And the objective is that we make it to the finish line. Now, on, in the way, while getting there, we're going to go through ups and downs and all types of, you know, issues will come across our way. But the important thing is to make it till the end. If we don't know how to deal with hardship, we will collapse. People collapse. And then they never make it to the finish. Not the first, not the second, third, last. They simply never pass. The finish line, they never cross it. And then that means that that person has been deprived of entering paradise. Believe it or not. And so what differentiates a believer from an unbeliever is our ability to deal with hardships. And why would there be a flagship in hardship? Well, because hardships are a blessing in so many ways. Hardships are a form of blessing. And this has to be qualified. It has to be qualified by, by what? When we make a statement, how do we qualify it? Because I feel like it? Because I think so? Or because of what? Are you, are you guys shy all of a sudden? Evidence? Good. From where? From the Quran and the Sunnah. Huh? Not from Mawlana. Unless Mawlana is quoting the Quran and the Sunnah. But it's actually the Quran and the Sunnah. And 
if we don't have such evidence, then we can never make such claims. Like people say, ignorance is bliss. Right? That's a very common expression amongst the non-Muslims. You can't as a Muslim say, you know, uh, ignorance is bliss or I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Excuse me? And I know people say it, uh, you know, hypothetically or figuratively, they don't mean that. But at the end of the day, you're going to be the devil's advocate. Thank you so much, brother. But you know, billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Go away. Uh, realistically speaking, some of these expressions we have to be careful of. Ignorance is bliss. No way, Jose. Ignorance is, is a one-way ticket to the hellfire. Now, you cannot be ignorant. You have to learn. Knowledge is light. Ignorance is not bliss. Similarly, we have to be careful of some of these expressions which we make. So we have to qualify it. So let's see what y'all got. Can anyone tell us or share an evidence about first the fact that we will go through hardship, that hardship is inevitable? The first title is hardship is inevitable. You, you cannot avoid it, you cannot escape it, it's gonna come. Who can think of an evidence and I'll give him nothing inshallah? Huh? Surah Al-Asr? That's an indirect way of looking at it, Mr. Nakhiz. But that's not what I had in mind. Thank you so much. Good. But I want something straight to the point. That's, that's nice. So what, where, where is Surah Yunus? Because you if you want me to remember the whole Surah right now in my mind and I pick out the ayah, that's great. But I'm not that smart. What ayah in Surah Yunus? MashaAllah, that's a better answer now. Surah Yunus was manageable. Baqarah now, that needs like five people. Like, come on. Yeah, shit. Nice try. I'm not Zakir Naik. Thank you so much. Can you please tell me the ayah? Fine. But again, you're, this is just talking about the condition of human beings when afflictions take place. I want something that says, you will definitely be afflicted. Come on. Surah Ankabut, okay. أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَيُّتْرَكُ أَيَّقُولُ آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ There you go, that's straightforward. Do the people assume they will say we believe and yet they will not be tested? Then Allah promised that we will be tested. There you go, this is direct. Or, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَبَتُمْ مُصِيبَةً قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا لَهِ رَاجِعُونَ Until the end of the ayat. We will surely inevitably test you with some of fear, poverty, and loss of, of wealth and life, whether someone gets sick or someone dies from among the family members or ourselves, and give glad tidings to the and fruits, the marat, all types of vegetation, and give glad tidings to the patient ones. Of course, among many other ayat, Allah says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ fitna," And we test you with evil and good as a test, as a trial, as an examination. So these are the ayat which prove that no one is going to escape this test. Now you know what's crazy? This lecture, as a similar topic, right, uh, was delivered in Riyadh, but in a workshop format. And we were discussing the same exact topic. And so while I'm telling the people, you know, we will all get tested, a brother who's like maybe 40 years old, he said, never in his life was he ever tested. Nothing. Yes, and everybody's like, please. He said, never felt grief, never felt sad, <laughs> nothing of any sort, any type of anything we can call ibtila, fitna. He said, it, it did not come to him in any way, shape or form. Of course, you know, out of, out of respect, I didn't say anything. I was going to tell him, this is it right there, buddy. This very thing you're saying is the biggest fitna of your life. The fact that you think you've never been tested is the fitna, is the ibtila, which you're not even aware of. But of course, I had to be nice and say, okay, akhi, zakallah khair. Inshallah, no one will you know, give you hasad from among the audience, because that's just far-fetched. Can't claim that you've never been tested in your life. Is there one like him here? Please raise your hand. We'll talk to you after the lecture, inshallah. Got a few muscular brothers back there. 
Al-Muhim, so you know, it, it's gonna happen. This is mercy from Allah. Why? Because human beings are able to react better when prepared. What's the thing that students hate the most? Exams, generally, specifically, pop quiz. You remember that term? Or maybe they don't use it in Saudi, I don't know. Pop quiz, when the teacher out of the blue, huh? without any pr further prior notice, without anything, okay everyone, good morning, we're having a quiz. Like, <gasps> and that quiz would be graded, and whether you will pass or fail, it's based on, it's like, no. At least tell me ahead of time, at least I know I deserve to fail. But now you completely caught me off guard. We hate pop quizzes, or at least we're supposed to hate pop quizzes, unless you're the nerd of the class. In which case you like pop quiz, exams, popcorn, everything. Popcorn? That was not part of the discussion. Anywho, how did we get to popcorn? Uh -huh, we haven't had dinner. Besides that, the reality is we don't like this kind of surprise element. Even if your boss is gonna fire you, would you prefer a notice, a one month notice? Listen man, you have one month to finish off your stuff and you know, see you later inshallah. But you can do your transfer, your sponsorship to another company for, versus one beautiful morning he brings you into the office says, you're fired, pack your stuff and leave. It's not the same. Some of you are having flashbacks. <laughs> Why did that happen to me eight times already? Something's wrong with you if this happened eight times by the way. <laughs> you need to take a course on how to be a good employee. Uh, bottom line is, we don't want any surprises. So the mercy of Allah is such that He informed us. And He told us that our whole life is going to be like that. What is the evidence that your whole life will be full of struggles? Today is the examination. This is a pop quiz for you right there. Look how many have failed already, mashallah. Surah Yunus, Surah Al-Baqarah. <laughs> yeah, you say that to the teacher in class. Where's the answer? It's in the book. It's right there, teacher. Look, read through the book, inshallah, you will find the answer for the quiz you just gave me. Teacher's gonna like that a lot. So what is the evidence that you will have these tests ongoing? As long as you're breathing and there's a soul in his body, you're gonna be tested. There are two ayat I can think of. Abdullah? How about... Oh, human being, you will strive and struggle huh, to get to your Lord. You will go through it until you meet Him. This is how it's going to be. There will be this striving and struggling. That's one ayah. And لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have created the mankind in turmoil. It's the whole time you're going through ups and downs. This is the way life is. So now that we know it's going to happen, the intelligent thing to do is learn how to react as per the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and as per the guidelines which Allah laid down in the Qur'an. Because if we don't, then this ibtila will become double. The calamity will become double. The test will become double. First, it's something that we dislike as human, being, uh, human beings. Secondly, we didn't react Islamically, so now we also lost reward and we will gain sin then it's a lose-lose situation. What is the good news? Would there be any good news in this discussion? Surely. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ al الْجَزَاءَ مَا عِظَمِ الْبَلَاءَ Really the, the amount or the proportion of the reward or the, uh, the value of the reward is proportional to the type of calamity that you go through. Meaning, the more distressed you get, the more reward you'll be given. Alhamdulillah. So anytime we get a lot of problems, if we deal with them properly, then we have a lot of good deeds, insha'Allah ta'ala. He said, alayhi salamu, And verily, if Allah loves a certain type of people, if He loves a person, in other words, He will test them. So you look at Ibrahim, you look at Nuh, you look at Yunus, you look at any prophet, you will see that they went through the biggest type of struggles. What's worse than you going to your own people and try to save them from the fire and they tell you you're a liar, you're a magician, we will kill you, get out of our town, so on and so forth. Being rejected and then being, huh? Attempted murder, attempted, you know, all types of things were attempted against them to remove them completely from their lives. Subhanallah, what greater calamity. And these are the most truthful people on earth. So that tells you because Allah loved the prophets, they were tested. 
Now, what is the bottom line? إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا إِبْتَلَهُمْ Then look at the continuation of the hadith. فَمَنْ رَضِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى huh. Whosoever is pleased, not that you're going to celebrate that a calamity befell you, but whoever is pleased, meaning he deals with it in a proper Islamic way, then he should be given the rida, the pleasure of Allah. Allah will be pleased with that person. وَمَنْ سَخِطَ فَلَهُ السَّخَطِ And whosoever is displeased, then Allah will become displeased with him. So then we have to be very careful that a calamity strikes, we are displeased with Allah, then Allah will become displeased with us on top of the calamity. So we lose the reward which we could have gotten from that. Uh, now, another benefit of these calamities is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدِهِ الْخَيْرِ عَجَّلَ لَهُ الْعُقُوبَةَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِذَا أَرَادَ بِعَبْدِهِ الشَّرْ أَمْسَكَ عَنْهُ بِذَنْبِهِ حَتَّى يُوَفِيهِ بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ رواه الترمذي وصححه الألباني رحمه الله في صحيح الترمذي That's a very important hadith. Maybe you haven't come across it before. The Prophet ﷺ said, If Allah intends good for a slave of his, huh, he will hasten his punishment in the dunya. If one of us goes off the track, he will get it. And if Allah loves that person, he will punish them in the dunya. Because that punishment will do what? Expiate. Huh? It will expiate, it will erase that sin. And if Allah intends evil for that person, for whatever wisdom Allah knows about, He will postpone. He will not punish him for this, and then He will have him pay for it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So some people wonder, yeah, how come these, these people are disobeying Allah night and day, and they're living a lavish life and nothing happens to them, blah, blah, blah. That's a very bad sign. The fact that they're already in the state of disobedience and Allah is not hastened in the punishment, that means that Allah is trying to make it worse for them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That's a disaster. Whereas if they're being punished right now, it means Allah intends goodness for them. Then they're paying for it now because paying for it now is manageable. Why is it manageable? If one of us is, is, is struck with any type of calamity in this dunya, I'm saying it's manageable. What's my evidence that it's manageable? Ahsant. Allah doesn't burden his soul beyond its scope. No one can say it's more than I can handle. Anyone who commits suicide, they did not commit suicide because they reached a point where they could not handle. They chose not to handle the situation. They chose willingly. Otherwise, Allah gave him enough to be able to manage. So that's an excuse. A lot of people make excuses. Smokers make excuses. I can't stop smoking. You're a liar. Sorry. You can stop smoking if you wanted to. If there was a strong enough reason. If a doctor told you you're going to die soon, you better believe he will stop smoking. But because there isn't such a warning, they continue smoking and they tell you, I can't stop. I can't stop. Not true. There's just a human mentality. We claim that this is too much. It's actually not too much. We're just claiming it's too much to make it okay for ourselves. So then we have to be worried about that. That if we don't get punished, Allah al-musta'an. Allah al-musta'an. Now the punishment doesn't mean that you crash with your car and you lose a leg or you get in an accident. It doesn't have to be something physical necessarily. This could impact each person in different ways in their lives. It could be the loss of commitment. It could be the loss of knowledge. It could be the loss of so many things. It does not have to be related to uh, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and the, you know tsunamis and things like that. Not necessarily. It doesn't mean that Allah will punish all of Jeddah. Then we say, okay, Alhamdulillah, the people of Jeddah paid for their sins, so now they can go back and party again. It doesn't work this way. No. So among the benefits of ibtila or hardship, the expiation of sins and the erasing of sins. Then, if that person is already on good terms with Allah, then this will be means for them to have higher rank. Now their ranking with Allah will become higher on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and in, in the life to come in Jannah. They will get higher degrees. Um, thirdly, what happens is, it's, the, it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. When this happens, this is when some of us realize that, okay, you know what? I need to stop. I'm going the wrong way. I need to stop. Calamities are a wake-up call for many people. We continue to be heedless and, and, and uh, you know, regretful, uh, uh, 
uh, I'm negligent, I'm sorry about the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal, until calamity strikes, like whoa, 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 okay, I will stop now. It happens all the time. And some people don't stop until the calamity strikes. We seek Allah's refuge. Then it opens the door for repentance, for the person humbling themselves before Allah Azza wa Jal and making dua. A lot of us are heedless about the dua until there's a need, right? We don't make dua until there's a need, there's a necessity, there's an urgent matter. Then suddenly we make abundance of dua. When things were smooth, no need for dua, right? So how does Allah Azza wa Jal keep one of us in that contact with Him? Subhanahu wa ta'ala, by allowing sometimes these events to take place because they act as a reminder, as, as a source of repentance for the slave. Fifthly, it reminds us of the situation of the people around us. I mean, you know, you might be living a comfortable life, everything is going in order as per your dreams and expectations. And while people around us or other Muslims are struggling, when do we feel with them when something happens to us? Then we realize, okay, subhanAllah, now I know what it's like to be hungry. Right now, if any one of us is hungry and he's not fasting, how long does it take for you to get food? Honestly speaking, if you got super hungry, what is the bottom line? Within a couple of minutes, you're in the bagala and, and al bayk I don't know what you eat nowadays, and mashallah, tabarakallah, you're shoving down food down your throat. You don't have an issue. It's not like you say, I cannot afford to buy al bayk But are there people who cannot afford to buy al bayk or even less than that? Surely. We don't think about it until you find yourself in a situation where you're hungry and you can't feed yourself even though you're not fasting. Then you think, oh subhanAllah, how many Muslims in the world right now are in this situation? So these, these trials from Allah allow us to think about fellow Muslims which we generally don't think about, being honest with ourselves. We ask Allah to forgive us. Uh, sixthly, it strengthens the person's iman and the qada and the qadar of Allah Azza wa Jal. You, you believe in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're very heedless about that. People attribute everything to luck and you know, lucky numbers and all types of supersti superstitious beliefs. But in reality, you will know, ouch. Yep. Uh, we all know that it's all part of the qadar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This calamity which befalls one of us was written how many? Thousand years before the heavens and the earth were created, 50,000 years, right? It's all been decreed by Allah Azza wa Jal. It's only materializing in our lives. And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٌ Amazing is the affair of the believer. His affair is all good. If a calamity befalls him, he is patient and this is good for him. If goodness comes to him, he is thankful and this is good for him and that is only for the believer. So that means even when the calamity strikes, it's good for the believer. Allah decreed it way back, it's good for us. It's part of our qadr. So we believe in the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Lastly, you remember that um, this, this, the reality of this world and it's glitter and bling bling and all the mesmerizing elements of it you get to realize that this world is nothing but, you know, a big bag of trash. Really, that's what it boils down to. It's, it is not the abode. How often does it go good and then it goes bad very quickly? And we are in like super, here, here in this place, in this country, we are like enjoying the biggest blessings of Allah, I think, in the world. In so many ways. Versus other countries where there's turmoil, fighting, wars, bombing, shooting, you name it, right? On a much large, on a large scale. Or countries where Islam is absolutely absent from the lives of people. Different countries in the Western world, whatever. It's just they're living in complete, immersed in the dunya. Immersed in the dunya completely. Islam doesn't really play any role in their lives. So we are, we have been blessed by the way in so many ways by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also a test for us. So what happens to one of us when calamity strike? When a calamity or when we face hardship, each one of us is one of three people. Let's do it together. What do you think the first type of person would be? What is the attitude of some when calamity strike? They become what? They become displeased with Allah. Does that happen? Do we have Muslims who behave this way? I hear it often. And because of this WhatsApp, 
uh, uh, world that we live in, wherein people add you without any prior notice, right? You just get a message from someone, that person is nothing but, you know, plus four, four, six, seven, five, five, or plus nine, one, nine, or plus nine, seven, two, and just, it's a number. And of course, some have etiquettes. Salam alaikum, kafil hal, do you mind if I ask a question? And some say, answer quickly. How many times do I have to pray with her? Sorry, sir. I'm, I apologize. I didn't know the hotline I created for fatwa, uh, you know, wasn't working as efficiently as you wanted. Excuse me. And then they get mad. If you don't answer after five minutes, you get like these three question marks, exclamation marks. What's, the, what's wrong with you? You're not doing what I hired you for, brother. Don't you remember? I pay your salary to answer questions on WhatsApp. No, I don't remember. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. But anyways, that's another agony I will discuss in the lecture. What's up with WhatsApp? Until then, you hear this stuff from Muslims. You know, I met, this, I met this girl and I want to marry her. But her father said, no. Why is Allah doing this to me? How am I supposed to answer that? Well, brother, let me tell you why Allah is doing this to you. Really? Who in the world is going to speak on behalf of Allah? But then, Yaqi, why did you meet this girl to begin with? Is it my fault that you met the girl? Oh, we met in school, we met on Facebook, we met in Batiqa. That's your problem. That's not my problem. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why your father is not happy with you and her. It could be so many different things. People generally have an attitude of, إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ that, What's going on? Why is Allah doing this to me? Or why is Allah doing this to the Muslims? We say this is a form of being displeased with the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal, with the ibtila of Allah, and that person unfortunately automatically lose any type of reward prepared for the patient people. That person is excluded. Evidence, the woman who was crying when her son had died, I believe, and the Prophet ﷺ passed by her, and he gave her some reminder, and she kind of shunned him, not knowing he's the messenger of Allah, she thought he was a regular man, just advising her. She shunned him, and then later she was told, this is the messenger of Allah who advised you, right? And then she, she you know, realized her mistake, she went back to him, and then he told the very, the, the sabr is with the sadmat al-ula, it, it's with the, the initial reaction. You're not the initial reaction, you lose your mind, you pull your hair, you punch three people, then later say, okay, it's time to have sabr now. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ya akhi, ba'd ish, Allah yahdik. You lost all, <laughs> everything already, you exploded, and then later, 10 minutes later, he remembered that it's time to be patient. That's a little too late, man. Patience is that very moment when you're going to lose it, you control yourself. It's difficult though, right? Especially when you have children. Okay, for those who have children. For those who don't have children, they're like, oh wow, wait. Do I need to bring children later on in life? Yes, you do. Inshallah. We need to have more people in this ummah and you'll be just fine. There's good days and bad days with kids. The good days are very nice. Especially when they're funny and they make you know, funny stuff. You will enjoy that as well, inshallah. 2% of the time, but still, something to appreciate. <laughs> Tayyib, how did we get here? Uh, so the first one, Allah understand. We seek refuge with Allah from being among those people. The second one is, He's okay, right? He's not overreacting, he's not upset. Uh, he's barely hanging in there. Huh? He has good assumption about Allah. Alhamdulillah ala kulli He's not very overly happy, right? But he has good assumption about Allah Azza wa Jal. That is the second level which I believe most of us will probably fall into when we don't fall into the first one. We seek refuge with Allah. When we're not doing bad, we probably fall into the first one. If we're on a good day, the second. The third one is for the elite. And if you're one of them, I give you two thumbs up. The third one is the one who he receives this calamity with contentment and thankfulness to Allah. Don't misunderstand now. It doesn't mean that this person is asking for more. He's not naive. Like, oh Allah, give me more calamities, this is great. That's not, that's not what is intended. It's just that that person is at, at that level of iman where he has understood the, the hikmah, the wisdom behind these calamities. He's at that level where he's able to appreciate it. Alhamdulillah, but he, he sincerely means Alhamdulillah. He sincerely means it. He says it with a heart full of mindfulness of Allah and love of Allah. This is good for me. If Allah did this for me, it is ultimately good. It appears to be bad outwardly. But his level of iman allows that person to see beyond the apparent. 
Not that they have some special Sufi skills, but they have understood the deen enough to know that there's more to it. So they are the people who deal with it adequately. Like Shu, like, like who? Like Shu. <laughs> Combination of uh, Lebanese and, and, uh, and English. It doesn't work. Like who? Sheikh Rasam ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh Rasam ibn Taymiyyah was actually thankful to Allah that he was imprisoned. Really? Can any one of us go to prison? We seek refuge with Allah from that and say, this is, that was great, it happened to me, you know? Seriously, honestly, no. But for him, it was means for him to engage in more ibadah. It was means for him to author more work. It was means for him to educate the people in prison. He, he was a reason for them to learn the deen and return to Allah Azza wa Jal. So that, that imprisonment for him brought about many benefits which didn't exist when he was free. And that's why he said to Ibn Qayyim, ما يفعل أعدائي بي or ما يصنع أعدائي بي what will my enemies do to me my jannah is in my in my life in my chest my jannah is with me خلاص he had reached that level of contentment where he was he was dealing with it in the most mature Islamically mature way possible رحم الله شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية رحمة واسعة now so what are we supposed to do when calamities strike first Know that this is from Allah. Number one, it is from Allah. And in our case, most likely, most likely it is associated with another fact, which is the ayah. What is the ayah that whatever happens to us is because of us? Wallah, today the score for the exam is zero. <laughs> no, actually somebody gave me a right answer. I think it's like five out of a hundred. What is the evidence that or who can cite one evidence that whatever problems come to us is because of us? That's a big evidence, Akhi. Where can I find it? You know, I've been sarcastic. <laughs> Our sins, of course, what is the evidence for that? It's the right answer. I need the dalil. Mm-hmm. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Subhanallah Whatever calamity befalls you That's the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran Whatever calamity befalls you is due to what you have earned with your own hands And Allah pardons a lot Meaning if we were to be treated as per what we earn with our own hands We wouldn't even be here right now right? But because Allah Azza wa Jalla forgives and pardons Then we survive but any calamity is generally because of what we have earned in our own, with our own hands. We would say that it is not necessarily applicable to the prophets. Meaning the prophets we know for sure is because they had such high level of iman. And Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to, them to be examples. And because he loved them so much, they were given these tests. I'm saying this so no one will say, aha, therefore the prophets had the most sins. And they, that's why they were tested the most. No, 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 no. Not the messengers of Allah. This is applicable to regular human beings like us. So know it's from Allah Azza wa Jal and it's because of what we're doing so we need to huh, make a U-turn. Secondly, follow the Islamic legislation and we will deal with some of the expressions we're supposed to say. Do not then, do not become displeased with the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Follow the Islamic guidance. What are you supposed to say when a calamity strikes? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Then, ah. MashaAllah, more than one person with the wrong answer. That's just fantastic. Huh? Aywa? Jazakillah khairan, sister. Women always win. There's a continuation for the dua, which is Allahumma. There's a scholar is different on journey or journey. It's not an issue right now. There's there's room, but this one of them is Allahumma journey fi musibati wa khlifli. Allah, reward me with goodness for my calamity and make it up for me with something better than that. Of course, who did this? Umm Salama said this one. Abu Salama died and then she was thinking what could be better than, who could be better than Abu Salama? Well, after she made this dua, the Prophet وسلم, married Umm Salama. That's who's better than Abu Salama, the Messenger of Allah. That was just a, a real life example of how that dua brought about something better for Umm Salama, the mother of the believers. So we have to have this yaqeen in Allah Azza wa Jal. 
When a calamity strikes and we say these expressions, we have to say them. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we often don't even remember the dua. Some of us obviously don't know it to begin with, and those who know it don't remember to say it. But this is critical. This is critical that we memorize it and we implement it. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will make it up. It doesn't mean that if you lose something, you, you know, turn around, you look back, oh, it's right back, you know, right there, two of them. Aha, I lost one, I got two. Don't be, you know, silly like that. We don't know how this will be made up. But we believe that Allah Azza wa Jal will make it up, either in the dunya or in the akhirah. Tayyip. And that, fourthly, we should, seek, uh, we should seek Allah's forgiveness and repent. Know that this is because of our shortcomings, so this will be a reason for us to start a new page with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. Good, we have time. So what are we supposed to do? Since Allah Azza wa Jal had, this is a trick question if I may say. We all know that everything happens by the qadr of Allah. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? Does anything happen that is outside the color of Allah? Are y'all sure? Tayyip. Then why do you make dua? So, uh, wait, uh, Fatima, you open the door now. Uh, because now you're saying that we are mukhayyar, we're not mukhayyar, huh? we're musayyar, we're forced to do things. Allah decreed we made dua, we made dua. Why do we make dua? It's a very tricky thing. Focus with me. Don't, don't rush, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, focus with me. Everything has been decreed by Allah. If Allah had decreed that you're going to get this car, you will get the car. Why are you making dua? Jazakallah khair, Abdullah. The Prophet sallallahu told us, the only thing which can huh, return, which can change the qadr is dua. Subhanallah, dua. In fact, in one of the hadith, if the calamity is befalling, befalling one of us and he makes dua, then they will continue to struggle in, in the sama. They will continue to struggle until the end of time. The, 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 the calamity will never make it down because of the dua which was going up to Allah Azza wa Jal. So the dua is actually a fundamental element of that. And yes, it is the decree of Allah and it's the command of Allah. We do it, but we also understand the wisdom. That dua has an impact because we know that the qadr of Allah is at different levels. You know what Allah decrees on Laylatul Qadr and what Allah decrees for the whole year and for, whole, for the whole life. These actually change, there are, there's a variation between them. يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah Azza wa Jal erases whatever He wills. So there are elements where your dua will change the qadr. That's why the, the relationship with Allah is a dynamic one. Otherwise we'll be like puppets. You're just living out your life as per the decree of Allah and you'll have absolutely no involvement. If you're confused about this matter of Qadr, watch the lecture, Do I Have a Choice? Okay? When you're free, go on YouTube, type, Do I Have a Choice? And put my name somewhere in that title so you won't get us. Very often I realize that my titles are close to songs. I didn't know that. But if you just go put one of my titles on YouTube, you, you come up with, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. I was like, what is this? It was my lecture. It turns out that these, I probably got it from somewhere back in the days and I didn't realize it. So I try to come up with titles now that don't have song related uh, ideas in them. But nevertheless, make sure you add, you add Islam somewhere there so you won't wind up seeing something that you don't want to see. But watch the lecture, do I have a choice? It's about this topic that many Muslims are pretty confused about. Do I have a choice? Do I not have a choice? Am I just doing what Allah decreed for me? So Allah decreed I go to Jahannam, I go to Jahannam. What's the point of me praying? What's the point of me being good? If Allah had decreed already that I'm going to wind up in Jahannam. Many people don't know how to answer this adequately. So watch out for that one. Now, dua. Secondly, what else are we supposed to do when calamity strikes? What did the Prophet Wasallam do when something uh, bad would come to him? Fazi'a ila as-salah. Huh? He, would, he would run and escape from that calamity to pray. He would engage in ibadah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we all know that when he would see the clouds, when he would see the clouds, what would he do? His face, his facial expressions would change. And Aisha described him. He would go in the, in the house, out of the house. He becomes uneasy. When he would see the clouds, he would become uneasy. And she would tell him, what happened? And he would tell her, I fear 
You know, I fear that this will be like the nations before us. They will say, you know, this is, this is a cloud that's gonna mumtiruna, that's gonna bring us rain. But it was, a, it was a punishment of Allah. Only when it rains, and it's rain, you know, the, the rain is barakah, then his heart would ease, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Know that, okay, this is not the adab. Because it could be the adab of Allah. So this was the manner of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, uh, fourthly, what are we supposed to do also when these calamities strike? Recite Quran. Why? Because Allah said that it is shifa. It is a cure. It's a, it's a treatment. It's a remedy for the heart. So when we're feeling uneasy, when a calamity strikes, we should recite the Quran. Not listen to Beethoven. Uh, fifthly, now, the dua which we mentioned earlier, alhamdulillah, we already used it. Tayyip. So in conclusion, the flagship of hardship, we will not be able to escape it. Now, we have to be prepared. Preparation for this is the key to success. This means each one of us has certain requirements. The requirements are that we familiarize ourselves with the conduct of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi when calamities would strike and we try to emulate him while we admit our shortcomings and our being far away from how he did things Alayhi Salatu Salam. Most importantly, the ad'iyah. Even though I didn't highlight it now, but we all know that the dua, any calamity which when, when, when Yunus was in the belly of the whale, what did he say? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al This is among the ad'iyah which no believer, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, no believer makes except that Allah Azza wa Jal will respond to that person's dua. So, you know, when these calamities strike, we need to bring these to mind. Remember the prophets, remember the messengers, we remember the calamities, and we try to say what they said. Nowadays, we say curse words, we say bad words, we, some people curse time, some people curse this and they curse that, they get into all types of issues. It's because our lack of implementation of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And, and if you go to the book, The Muslim Fortress, there's a chapter that deals with the, uh, the things you say when there's, there's a type of ibtila. When you're worried, when you're distressed, you know, there are certain ad'iyah that the Prophet ﷺ would say to ease his heart. Again, we might be unaware of them completely. Some of us might not even know they exist. Or they have one word memorized. Or they know it only in Urdu or English. We don't know the Arabic. The, the book, The Muslim Fortress, besides the few weak narrations in it, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a book. It's not a... Munazzal, it's not a Quran that has been revealed. Overall, it's an authentic book with some minor, minor issues here and there that you can easily cross-check and verify. It's an excellent book for each one of us to memorize. It's actually like a manual for life. It's a manual for our lives in terms of what to say in the salah, the different, uh, you know, Salat al ibrahimiyyah the different wordings of it, the different versions of it. What to say when you wake up in the morning, what to say when you, before you go to bed, what to say when you wake up from your sleep in the middle of the night, what to say before you enter the bathroom, after you leave the bathroom. Subhanallah, so many things, all of them are in this tiny little book, which is all over the Muslim world, in all languages. And some of us know 1% of it, 2% of it, 3% of it. But if you told them about anything else, Huh? Enumerate the name of the you know, Brazilian soccer team. He will tell you, you know, this guy, that guy, he was drafted in this year, he's that old, he has that many kids. MashaAllah. no issue. If you want to memorize the name of football players, that's your business. But what about the adiyah? What about the simple things that are, that are the, the nutrition and vitamins for your life? We don't know them. So we just have to shift our focus. If we know these things and implement them, then every ibtila is good news. The, the, the minimum, the bare minimum is, I paid for it now, I don't have to pay for it then. Alhamdulillah. Or on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the people, huh? the people who, 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 when they see, the people who didn't have any calamities in this dunya, like big time, when they see those who were tested with calamities, they will wish that their skins were, were like clamped. You know, with, all, with forks, 
just because of the ajr that Allah will give those who were tested in this dunya with calamities. They will wish they were in their shoes. They would wish more calamities befell them in the dunya. So we don't have to wait that long. Every calamity can be a flagship, could be the purpose, the reason behind our success in this life, provided that we deal with it Islamically. It could happen in our wealth, it could happen in our health, it could happen in the wealth and health of people that are related to us, it could happen in our careers, in our jobs, it could happen in so many different ways. In our religious commitment, all of these are part of the equation. All of them are part of the equation. That means Allah is reminding us. It's a reminder from Allah, we should not be heedless about it, we should return to Allah Azza wa Jal in repentance. We ask Allah to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم عن نبينا محمد. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. I'm definitely going to fail now. Allah مستعان. أيوة عبد الله. إيه. نعم. ايه ايه can you translate that zalakhir <laughs> he he actually reminded me of of a stronger evidence that we said that a person that, that level of pleasure with allah azza wa that even when a calamity strikes a person a person is th thankful to allah we used ibn taymiyyah as an example but there's actually a hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi which is even much stronger as usual that if a man loses his child, you know, uh, uh, you know, the child of a person is what, what meaning it has in his life. And then he, he praises Allah, right? And he's pleased with it. Then what would Allah Azza wa Jai say to the malaika? That I have taken his, huh? the dearest one to him in his life. How has he reacted? They say, oh Allah, he's praised you then. He'll be given a, a house in Jannah, right? From what I remember, the hadith, correct, Abdullah, or did I miss something? No. So, that's, that's another example. Now, you can imagine if a person doesn't have that level of iman, and they lose their child, what will they do? They will constantly think, you know, why did Allah do this to me? How come Allah, you know, He knows how much I love this child? Why did He take, you know, people, even did these thoughts which the mind, you know, they run through the mind, some people entertain them, even though they don't verbally say them, but this is what's crossing their mind all the time. This is a sign. Of course, the shaitan will whisper some of them. But a believer will shun these ideas. Seek refuge with Allah and remind himself of the hadith. Remind himself of the Prophet ﷺ who lost his son, Ibrahim. It doesn't mean the person doesn't cry, right? Because when the Prophet ﷺ lost Ibrahim, his son, he cried. But then he said only that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's about that level of iman and reaction. It goes back to our reaction to calamities. Zakallah khair, Abdullah Hassan. Any other questions or reminders for things I might have missed? Yes, sir. Waikum uh, salam. Let's say we have, let's, we believe that we are being tested and you know, we are okay with it. Kind of. We are okay with it. Is it okay for you to think that, okay, let this continue and uh, because we are scared of something bigger might happen? Sometimes that crosses my mind. I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Uh, like I see sometimes I'm being tested. Okay. But it's not a very big test. Okay. It's a small one. And I'm okay with it. Sometimes I'm actually worried that if, I, if this goes away, some, a bigger test might come. Is that okay? Uh, I don't know because, you know, it's all part of the unseen. It's all based on guessing. So like, should, like, <clears throat> this, uh, like, uh, like should I, sometimes, I don't know whether it's shaitan or it's the right one. <laughs> Neither do I. Uh, because sometimes I'm actually uh, not making dua that this should go away and, you know, uh, my man is going to be better. I would never, look, honestly, I would not... I understand what you're saying, but I would never be able to answer you or even give you some sort of advice unless I know what it, what it is that's happening. You don't have to tell us, obviously. I'm not trying to push you to tell us. But, but I, I'm trying to understand what, what kind of calamity might be befalling you that you don't mind continuing. Uh, like, you, you'd rather I'm, have it on you right now. I will not do that very well with my test, right? Okay. And I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. I feel that, okay, I can do that. Wallahi, akhi, listen, man, feel the way you want to feel. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what to tell you. I get you. I do get things that, okay, maybe if this was and I do get what I'm, you know, uh, what I can. Yeah. Uh, but 
That's the most difficult question I've ever been asked. <laughs> I failed, yes, for sure. Like minus five. My hair grew because of this, huh? Yeah, again, he's, he's happy that it's not worse. So I'm, that's why I'm having a hard time giving him an answer. Because if I tell him, Tawwi, stop thinking this way, then something big happens, he's going to blame me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I just, Zakallah khair, do what you want. Allah waffaq. Yes, sir? How can we say that this is a punishment? You never know. We, I mean, there are indications. But we have to assume all of the above. Because that is the most common, good you mentioned that, that's the most common question. This happened to me. Is it because Allah loves me? Is it a sin? Does Allah want to raise my level? No one can tell you that, right? So our reaction, as far as I understand, should be consider all of the above as possibilities. It could be because of A, B, C, D. It doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't matter because you will never know. You will never know in this, in this dunya. Therefore, your reaction should be the same. So then a person has self-inspection. Okay, if it is sins, then what sins? Then I need to leave those alone. If it is not that, and Allah is just simply testing that person to raise a degree, alhamdulillah, but you know, then it's just going to happen. Either way, the reaction is consistent. No matter what the reasons may be, our reaction should be consistent. It's not like we're going to tailor our reaction as per why it's happening. It really doesn't matter. It's a calamity. We, we dislike it. It's just nat natural disposition. We, we don't like it. But because of our belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, we understand the, the wisdom behind it, and then we develop the satisfaction with the qadr of Allah. But human beings prefer that they lived a perfect life, right? Everybody would prefer a perfect life with absolutely no, no calamities, no obstacles, no hurdles. But you know, that's just too idealistic. Any other questions? Yes, from the sister side, it's included already. Tayyib, there was three essays, uh, my mistake. Uh, my brother doesn't study and doesn't want to do anything except play games indoors, iPads, etc. He says, what will happen, what will happen in, is the qadr of Allah. He just doesn't care about anything, be it food or his, uh, whatever, his something, friends, etc. Um, he listens to us only when we tell him a hadith or so. But that vanishes over time. I don't understand what is wrong with him. What would you say to him? I would say to him what Umar said to someone um, who had stolen. Someone stole at the time of Umar. And, and then, you know, he wanted to use Qadr as an excuse. Just like your brother who's playing video games. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I only, يعني, it was the Qadr of Allah that I steal. He told him, It's the Qadr of Allah that I chop off your hand. I mean, you, so you can easily say it's the qadr of Allah and bring his mother with a, one of these nice shoes she has, smack him across his head, say this was the qadr of Allah as well. And I can throw you out of the house with the qadr of Allah as well. And you could become a beggar tomorrow with the qadr of Allah too. I mean, we could go as far as you want with the qadr of Allah, if you're just going to blame the qadr of Allah. So, you know, he just needs to wake up from his deep sleep. He, he, I, I know he's not that silly. He's being smart. <coughs> He's trying to be smart or outsmart you guys by using some religious trick huh, to tell you that it's all good. I know he's, I don't know how old he is, but that does not sound like someone who legit, legitimately play video games say, it's the color of Allah, wait, let me just win this game. I was the color of Allah, come on. And nobody's able to deal with this guy in the house? Invite me over. I'll strain him out for you, inshallah. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't play video games. We'll beat him in the game first, inshallah, then... We will tell him that he needs to stop playing video games and do other things as well. It's okay, there's, you know, there's room for a lot of stuff. Wait, wait, we still have two essays, Akhi. Oh, you know that he's your brother too? <laughs> Don't expose him, Tayyip. So, uh, he's <laughs> Wallahi. Yeah, he, study. he needs a psychiatrist, yes, yeah, Sheikh. No, no, he needs, he needs someone, I, I, he's just being funny. In my, how old is he? He's just being funny. Does he, I'm sorry, does he have, is he, 12 or 14 is a big difference. Is he, is he mentally deficient in any way? Is he smart? Extra smart. He's being, he's just playing you guys. 
Just let me deal with him, please. I'll deal with him for you, inshallah. Honestly. Take him for dinner. He'll pay. Uh, <laughs> regarding qada o qadar, can we say best of luck when we have exams to friend? No. My sheikh, uh, uh, Farid, he, 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 didn't, uh, he disliked us using the term luck. And it, luck wasn't part of his dictionary. There was no best luck or best of luck or lucky guy or lucky this or lucky that. He said this term contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah. And some will say, well, wait, but the Quran says, uh, uh, And they say, حظ is equivalent to luck. The Shaykh had his own way of looking at it, that this is the, you know, the, the, whatever Allah Azza wa had decreed as a, as a provision, and it's a matter of the qadr of Allah, it is not luck. Because you see, the words have connotations. Words have connotations, they have meanings. And in, in English speaking, in the English speaking world, luck is usually something that has nothing to do with the decree of God. By, by default, the general non-Muslim, when he hears the word luck, what comes to mind is something random from this worldly life, not God behind it. They don't connect these things to Allah Azza wa Jal. Therefore, we avoid these expressions that make that suggestion, besides the fact that we don't have a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, as far as I know, that supports such expressions. Okay, because the Muslims are going to fight, they're going different places, no one told them, you know, good luck, hope you will win, something like that. We don't know of any evidence, if you do, do no one, provide it. So these expressions, you know, what would be nice is, may Allah grant you success. Allah fil ikhtibar. Good luck, who's good luck? Is he his cousin, yeah, and he's gonna come with him in the exam? Hey, I'm good luck, I'm here to help you, give me the pencil. Never mind. Taib. If the parents work hard behind their kids a lot uh, in every possible manner, I'm trying to read this uh, properly, and they, uh, they provide their kids with the best, uh, the best something all the time. But if the kids are still too disobedient, they don't care, especially babies. Babies? Oh, boys, sorry. Boys. I was about to say the babies, yeah, they give them a break from two months. Come on, appreciate your parents, stop crying. Yeah. It's like, what do you want me to do? I have no other way of expressing myself. Um, especially boys. And this can, can now in the parents suppose to behave, react? Wow, I can't seem to figure this out. Um, my handwriting was is bad, but I finally saw a worse one. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I usually can't read my own stuff. <laughs> uh, in this case, now, in the parent, is the parent supposed to behave? I think the question is basically the react. How? How? Very good. How is the person supposed to behave or react? Okay, so the parents are doing everything for the kids and the kids just don't care, right? So do you stop doing everything for them? That's a very tricky question. That really depends on a number of factors. The fundamental answer is no, of course. You don't stop. You don't stop. You don't abandon and give up on your kids because usually it's not going to fix things, right? If they're disobedient, they're going to become worse because now they have a grudge and they have hatred and they're spiteful against you because not only, you know, they have issues with you and now you're, you've pulled out any type of support. So we say continue to support them, but find out why they're being disobedient and then treat that problem. So don't make a connection between you providing them and them disobeying you. They're not disobeying you because you're providing them. These are two separate topics. This is one thing, it's part of human nature, parents, children. Who else are the children going to depend on if their parents don't look after them? By default. But there's another issue, this is another zone. So deal with it independently, don't try to connect the two. That's my personal advice, don't connect the two. You look after them, you keep doing your best, because you're doing it for the sake of Allah, right? Trying to provide your children with the best. And what we mean best, it doesn't mean you buy them Xbox and Wii and a PlayStation 4 and say, Yeah, Sheikh, I've done everything for you, you disobey me, that's not what we mean. It means you give them their rights Islamically as well. 
when you, you, you give them everything they deserve as a whole package, then that, keep that on the side, come see why are they being disobedient. There must be a reason. They could be still at a young age, they don't have the proper perception of obedience, disobedience, they don't understand the impact of disobedience, they, don't, they cannot calculate things the way you calculate them. And if you go back in time when you were 18, you will realize you were much worse than they are now. Right? But you forgot, because when you were 18, you were foolish, and you thought you were smart. Now that you're a parent, you're like, how come they're behaving this way? Well, remember yourself. So I mean, a lot of this is logic, you know? And the kids just need some patience and forbearance and some guidance, people looking after them, being, being careful with them until they grow out from these little, you know, little kids' habits. It generally, they, they grow out of them. Otherwise, we can blame ourselves for not having raised them Islamically, not for giving them their rights. Don't stop giving their rights and say, Wallahi, they don't deserve it. No, continue, but we should blame ourselves. We did something wrong along the way. Now, Wallahu a'lam. Now, Zakallah khair. Make a lot of dua for them, Sahih. Sometimes we don't even consider that. Just why this and that? Make dua. <coughs> Subhanallah, the dua will, will has, يعني, Allah Azza wa Jal has made it a, a weapon among the most powerful weapons. Sometimes the only th weapon you have is dua and it's the most powerful. Anything else? No. I understand the question. The sister is asking this for those who cannot hear. Because they always complain that in the lecture you don't repeat the questions. So we didn't know what the question was said. I just remember now, so sorry for the questions that passed. Um, so, you know, sometimes uh, people generally think anything that happens to them is because of evil eye, is because of some jealousy, is because of some magic. And so it becomes like a phobia, right? A person is like, has this phobia that everything is because of something along these lines. So the sister is asking how much of effort should we exert towards that? Is it really like that? Do we have to always investigate and try to find out? And then to what extent do you go? Uh, because it's also part of the Qadr of Allah. And honestly, uh, while, while some of these calamities could be a result of that, it doesn't really matter often as long as we try to treat them the Islamic way. Meaning whether you know the root cause or you don't, unless it's sihr, and which requires that you find the type of magic and you try to destroy it, that's a whole other field. And the only person I can, or one of the people I can recommend in this regard is our brother Muhammad Tim Humble. So to answer your question in the most comprehensive way, I recommend that you listen to the series of lectures and some of the talks and, and classes of um, uh, Tim Humble on the matter of Ayn and Jinn and Sihr, because he's specialized in that. And mashallah tabarakallah, he's extremely trustworthy and he's a close friend of mine and a, a close brother. And I recommend that anything that anyone has to, you know, deals with that has to do with this type of stuff, because it's not my field of expertise, by all means. I am the last person you ask about them. He is the one I recommend you refer to. He has plenty of existing material, so you probably don't have to contact him, and his contact is even found online. So refer to him regarding this question in particular, because I personally don't know. What I know is, regardless of what the reason is, we try to treat the issue. But if it's something that it really has to do with magic, then you need to ask people who are experienced in this field. And I, I don't know much about that. No. Muhammad Tim Humble. Humble like someone who's humble. And subhanAllah, this, yeah, we don't want to praise him right now. We'll zip it. Any other questions, brothers and sisters? Yeah, Sheikh, after I turn off the recorder, all of you came with the questions? Khair. Well, it's not going to be money, akhi. I know that. It's not like someone's going to say, well, here's 10,000 riyas, go spend them, you know, <laughs> at Danub. So on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you will get the ajr. If somebody, if somebody wronged you, it's, the, the, the currency is hasanat and sayyat. Right? Good deeds and bad deeds. So that's why we know from the hadith of the Muflis, the bankrupt one, huh, who would have mountains of good deeds, but he will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he beat this guy up, he stole this guy's money, he did all types of haram. Then what would happen to him, right? All of his good deeds will become the money. He will be... It's a number of the company, so he might have good deeds at all. Huh? <laughs> 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 
See, Akhi, what, what bad is his iron sandwiches? That's a good one. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to lose on Yawal Qiyama too. The comp- I should work for a Muslim company from now on. At least I'll get my good deeds. No, Akhi, look. If <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. Yeah, if, if, if you were wronged, Allah Azza wa Jalla will give you right back. We don't have to, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot go into the details of how. The bottom line is, if when Fir'aun wronged people, can we say, well, because Fir'aun is a kafir, all the ones he wronged will not get anything in return for the wronging they had to go through? No. Even if Fir'aun had no good deeds, it doesn't matter. Allah Azza wa Jalla will make it up, right? In the case of the believer, it's like that. In case of the disbeliever, Allah will make up the right of every believer. As per the dhulm he had to undergo. No, you will, no, nobody will be wrong, inshallah. That was a good one. Inta, you, you burn everybody up, akhi. <laughs> Mashallah, tabarakallah. We get every secret that was there was gone already. Fulan, my brother is the one with the thing. Khalas, enough. We don't need to know your friend. Look, I, I know your question, akhi. Wallahi, <laughs> Allah. Some people prefer that they're not put on the spot. Look, long story short, obey your parents. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with that. Start your own business. Get out of the rat race, as they call it. You don't have to, you know, work for someone all your life. That's all dandy, right? As long as your parents don't say otherwise. That's just my advice. Because the last thing on earth you want to do is start your own business. Disobey your parents and then the business doesn't fly. Your life is over to a large degree because you're going to go to your parents with what face? You see what I'm saying? So I would say seek Allah's blessings by obeying your parents and getting a job and prepare them for this move of yours. Maybe, and they have a reason why, they are worried about you because they don't know whether you are qualified, capable of handling your own business or not. It's not easy to manage your own business, FYI, right? It's, it's an arm and a leg, it's a lot of work. Some people, you know, pull it, some people fail. And when they fail, they, they have to go back to getting a job. So the parents might be, they have this kind of vision, they, they know more, they're more experienced about your capabilities than your own confidence, with all due respect, whether you or your friend. You might be self-confident, but not every self-confident person made it. So I would say, you have nothing to lose if you had a regular job and it doesn't have to be forever. In fact, you can use this to at least sustain yourself, to, to be able to get on a, you know, stand on firm ground. And then that will be establishing gradually the, the, the paving the way for you to have your own business. In the meantime, you speak to your parents, you prove to them that you're able to keep a job, you're able to work, you're able to make money, then most likely they will support you if you have a good proposal. If you're unable to prove or convince your own parents about having a business, then you might not even be a successful businessman to begin with. Because you can't convince the closest people to you that you have a good proposal, you have a good plan, a good project in, in hand. So don't, I, would, I can never tell someone, ignore your parents, tell them forget about it, I'm going to start my own business anyways. You know what I mean? That's such a big risk, especially if the business doesn't fly. You see what I'm saying? And it, you know, there's no harm in working for a company, akhi. In, in, with the intention with the intention to become independent with the intention to start your own business but to jump from adulthood from teenage you know right to owning your own business what is the ratio of people that actually made it 10% nine, that means يعني, 1 out of 10 make it 9 fail 9 ya akhi hey Ayo ya Sheikh. La ya Sheikh. Now you don't, as far as I'm concerned, you don't pray istikhara to disobey your parents. The parents are telling you, do not, they want you to get a job. That's a command of the parents. I don't know of an evidence that allows me to disobey them. Personally, I don't know of an evidence that allows me to disobey them. If, if you feel differently, that's fine. I'm not going to impose my opinion on you. I personally will, I fail. I fail in being able to tell someone, khalli walli, do what you want. I, I can't, I, I cannot. Because I, to me, my understanding is, after Allah and His Messenger, وسلم, that in terms of rights, the, the, your parents come next. 
period. And the, the better your relationship with them is, the more Allah facilitates your life. That's my personal experience. The more you are on good terms with them, the more barakah comes from Allah. The more you, you, know, you mix things up and you ruin things with them, the worse your life will be. A lot of people do this when they want to get married. My parents don't approve. You know what? Forget them. I'm going to get married anyways. And they live the worst life. You know, the woman which the brother forse forsaked his parents for, or, uh, you know, eventually cheated on him. Now he's going to go back to his parents. Oh, Allah, you were right the whole time. And they're going to say, wow, really now? After you ignored us and you got married anyways, now you want to come back and you want us to open our arms and hug you? Some people do, some parents do it, some parents don't. So why would you ruin, why would you lose your relationship with your parents over a woman? Or a woman, uh, you know, her relationship with her parents over a man? Because of this love, you know, this love. This love which disappears in five minutes. You know? You can love someone so much and they sneeze once or they do something that is extremely repulsive and all the love goes away. It's like, whoa, did you just do that? It could be anything. Seriously. <laughs> Sorry, but the love just expired like right now. And then you have to deal with this person for the rest of your life. I mean, life is nice, love is nice, but you have to also give love its real value. It's a, it's a very tricky thing. It goes up, it goes down, it comes, it, it, it disappears, it grows. It's a very tricky thing. If you're going to base your life on love, you will ruin a lot of things in your life. So the parents, that's, that's a red line. Don't cross it. They tell you to jump, jump. Sit down, sit down. Work, work. Don't work. Quit the job, quit the job. Blind. Unless they're crazy. Shukran. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, shalala, ilaha, illa, ant. استغفرك أتوب إليك